Welcome to Super Fun Stuff and to our 10th print and paint video. Today I have a special episode where we make probably the coolest mini yet, using a new technique that I've never seen done before, and plenty of surprises. This video is going to be jam-packed full of awesomeness. Let's see what character we're going to make today. In my last video I said that we are making an Omega level mutant that has fought almost everyone in the Marvel Universe. I also said that this character is immune to Rogue's power siphoning power. And a few last clues. This character in the comics has committed acts of genocide, almost killed Wolverine which seems almost impossible to do, and it's not necessarily a villain depending on how you look at it. Without any more clues, who do you think it is? Now some of you comic book nerds like me probably got it with the clue about Rogue, but the answer is Magneto. Magneto, aka Eric Lesnar, was actually born with the name Max Eisenhart. Movies kind of ignored this and just went with the name Eric. In the movie, most of you probably know his backstories of being the only person in his family to survive the Holocaust and having that being one of the most important driving factors in his life. Now the comics in the movies diverge a bit as the movie seemingly simplifies the story. They leave out that Max was a Sonder Commando, which was a Jewish prisoner Nazi soldier, and didn't use or know of his powers until later. Most mutants get their powers at puberty, but Max had hepatitis at the time and his powers were still dormant. While Max was a Sonder Commando, he met a girl named Magda, married her, and had a daughter named Anya. So this is where Max changes his name to Eric Magnus Lesnar. He made a fake name to make their lives easier and to hide his past. Eric and his family quickly moved to the Soviet city of Venetia, and this is where Eric learns of his powers. First day there, he flings a crowbar with his newly discovered powers at his boss because he was going to be cheated out of his pay. When Eric leaves his work with his newfound powers, he comes back to the place his family was staying at and knows it was on fire with his daughter Anya trapped. Eric tries to use his powers to save her, but his boss called the KGB and they pin Eric down making him unable to save his daughter. His daughter dies from the fire right in front of him and Eric goes berserk. He uses his powers and destroys the KGB guys and half of the city. However, his wife sees all this happen and flees in terror. Unknowingly, Magda is actually pregnant with twins. I think you may know who they are. Eric eventually makes his way to Israel, and this is where he meets Charles Xavier. They team up a bit, debate on how mutants and humans can coexist, and eventually become frenemies just like the movies. The movies touch most of the major plot points of this backstory, and mainly just shorten it for time. So Eric is a tormented father who knows of the evilness of men, and believes that humans and mutants can never coexist and mutants should be on the top of the food chain. Well that was a long winded backstory, but I hope you learned something new that you just didn't get from the movies. So on to the model. Searching online you don't find too many Magneto models. Mostly you find his helmet or bust of old Magneto from the movies. However, I found one amazing 3D model. It's not free, but it's awesome. Here's a 3D model created by Sanex of Malik's 3D Designs. It consists of a detailed model of Magneto floating above a bunch of twisted metal and a large sentinel hand. If you don't know what sentinels are, they are large robots that want to capture or destroy mutants. The base alone looks awesome, and I usually don't like pre-made bases at all. He also gives you different heads, but come on, you have to pick the one with the helmet. So I take the model and scale it to the 40mm. The base was scaled 18%, while Magneto himself was scaled about 20% for printing. This model also comes very piece parted, so I combine and fit all the parts ahead of time in mesh mixer prior to printing. And this model prints great. The only area that needed fixing was around the helmet near the cheeks. The walls were too thin and I had to fill it with some extra resin. Pretty easy though. Then I take the model, slap him on the 50mm base, cause he's a bit larger, and add primer. Now we have our Magneto ready to be painted. This model should be pretty straightforward, but we're going to add some additional things to make it a bit better. Since my model is already on the base, I decide to finish the base first. That way, I won't get any of my dry brushing or base paint on the model itself. I go around and paint the silver first. I chose this color because I knew it was all over and in hard to reach areas. Then I go with the pewter gray I've been using on all the bases. Now we get to the part where I want to try something new. The sentinel hand is the main part of the base, and it's a usually strong purple color. Metallics make a good shiny surface, but I wanted to try something a little bit different. I watched some recent videos about chameleon paint, and saw that green stuff world had a good lineup. Unfortunately, that stuff is not cheap, and shipping seems quite long and even more cost. So I decided to find an alternative. The standard cheaper Michaels paint like the folk art ones also have a color shift paint version, but I wasn't happy with the results from watching some of the videos. 
Continuing to look online, I found an interesting way of how to do metallic chameleon paint on things. In the scheme of things, it's really no different than any mini painting technique. It focused on the use of chameleon pigments and how they were applied directly to the surface rather than mixed in a suspension like paint. And here's the funny part. These pigments are actually designed for fingernails. Yep, fingernails. I kind of took a chance with this as I didn't know if it was even going to work. But since I have daughters, I thought if I failed, I could at least do their fingernails. Anyways, I tested this out a bit before applying it on a miniature. They recommend using black as the base color, but everything was just way too dark and I wasn't too impressed. Then I tried a series of colors and washes in different combinations. What worked best was choosing a color that was both in the base color and in the color changing pigment. That way you get a nice strong color that also shifts. So for our model, the Sentinel's hand is purple and the chameleon pigment I picked was a pink to purple. I painted a base color purple, then dabbed on my chameleon pigment all over. This gives a cool shine, but also gives a nice shade of pink on the purple at different angles. It really worked well and my camera probably doesn't do it justice. So this method of painting a base color that is in the chameleon pigment gives a nice full color, but there are other ways to use this too. I decided to spice up the base a little further around the border. They made this nice metal border and I didn't want it just to be plain silver because that's just kind of boring. However, in one of my experiments, I used a base color of silver and a green to pink chameleon pigment. This gives hues of pink and green all over without taking any of the silver appearance away. This worked great and gave a different effect in the purple. Before moving to the washes, I add a layer of gloss varnish to the hand and outer rim. I found that these pigments can be a little messy and get all over the place unless you seal them. So sealing them right away makes everything much less glittery. Now to the washes on the base. I use a strong wash on the grays and a black wash on the silver. For the chameleon parts, I apply the same washes just very specifically. I tried to do washes prior to the nail pigments, but it didn't work so well. But applying them in specific areas afterwards did. So I take my washes and go around the purple in specific crevices. Now I wait for my washes to dry. After they dry, I go to dry brushing. I go ahead and dry brush the same layers of grays for the rocks and then apply pigments all over just like I did on my other bases. I use a dark brown pigment for the rocks and the same color for the silver. For the silver, I then add a little reddish and yellow pigments as well. To finish up the base, I add some details on the door. I add a blue and orange to make it a little more interesting. I paint it like it's scuffed and scratched, and I use some more of the chameleon pigments to make it shine in a few spots. Now the base is complete, and it's time to do the model. Magneto's color scheme is really simple. It's red and purple. He also has his face showing, so we need to include a flesh color. So I start with his face and quickly paint it with the flesh color. Then I go with the purple and finally the red. I decided to paint him similar to the classic comic style costume where he has rings around his forearms. With base colors done, we go to washes. I use a flesh wash for his face, a red wash for the red parts, and a purple wash for the purple. I also use black ink for the eye areas because I want them to be really dark and popping out. After he dries, he is ready for highlights. I start with red where I apply a brighter red and I just go around the highlighting his muscles and raised parts. To finish up the red, I use a watered down orange for additional color. Then I go to the purple. So instead of doing a basic lighter purple, I also include the color pink. If you look at many of the comics, the purple has many pink colors in it. And it also makes the colors just a little bit less muted. So using a purple pink mix, I highlight all over. To finish up the purple, I take a watered down version of the pink and just paint, paint the brightest areas. Next, I highlight his face with skeleton bone and to paint really small dots for his eyes. And here's Magneto, what an awesome model and fairly easy to paint. It would have been even easier if I kept the model separate from the base, but I want to make sure he was stable since he held together at a small contact point. Plus, I got impatient. The base is great too, and it had a lot of cool details. I especially love the Sentinel hand. Now, I showed you briefly a new technique on how to paint the Sentinel hand using nail pigments. Let's go into more detail about what I did. But our model is finished, so what should we paint? Well, since Magneto's destroyed a sentinel with his hand as evidence, what about the other parts of the sentinel? Why not his head? I found an awesome sentinel head created by 3D figures. It's actually Gambit Diorama, which Gambit looks great too. I might need to make him later, but I like the head so much. So I take that head and print it out. I scaled it to about 13%, just the right size with the hand. I add primer and the head is ready to go. A sentinel's head is bright 90s pink, like in your face pink and I want to make him just like I did with the hand with the shiny chameleon paint. So I go in and paint my base colors a pink and I hold off on the other colors. 
Then I take my chameleon pigment, use a little applicator brush thing, basically a Q-tip, and dab and rub it on the pink. You have to apply it fairly heavy for it to stick. And like all pigments, it gets all over the place, but you can wash it off pretty easily. And now we have a shiny pink head. It gives just the right amount of sheen and chameleon color to be cool, but definitely not overdoing it. Before painting the rest of the base colors, I add a varnish on top of the pink to seal it in. When that's done, I go in and paint the rest of the base colors. With the base colors done, this model's looking great. The pink shininess looks really cool and adds a cool effect. So now let's do the washes. Even if you stopped here, this would be a great terrain piece. But I like to spice it up with details, and this model is pretty simple. I highlight the flesh tone parts with a paler flesh tone color. And for the rest of the model, I use a silver. Since the pink is shiny and kind of metallic, silver looks great as an accent. I go around the main parts of silver for highlights. I then add silver to areas of destruction and add little silver scrapes and marks all over. It's a destroyed robot, so it's gotta be scuffed up a bit. I also add a bit of silver highlights to the silver parts, but nothing too crazy. Then, taking a dark brown pigment, I go to destroyed areas and make them a bit darker and distressed. I try to stay more on the silver areas rather than the pink. Silver shows these pigments off way better, and I want to keep the pink more vibrant. To finish this guy off, I paint his eye. This is the same way I paint gems too. I paint everything red, in the lower left corner I add orange, the upper right corner I add black, and then I add a few super small white dots near the black part. This way it always makes the lenses and gems look great, and it's so easy to do. And now we have ourselves a sentinel head that shimmers a bit and looks destroyed. This should make a really cool train piece in our Marvel game. I really like this head, and I could use more of these type of train pieces, but I don't like making or painting the same thing twice. I've done the repetitive painting things many times before, like assembly lines, and it's really no fun. So here is surprise number two. I decide to make a new sentinel head. I take the same model as the first sentinel head and create a full head. Basically, I duplicate and merge the heads together in Mesh Mixer. I also take the steel beams from the Magneto model and put it into the head, making it look like Magneto speared this guy in the head with beams. Using the sculpting tool in Mesh Mixer, I add destroyed metal parts around these areas. I remove sections like his jaws and add more cabling all over. I remove a section of his head and eye and add some metal parts to that as well. I took the time to change it up and make it look completely different than the first model. I also want it to be a little taller piece than the first one, and almost to be like the head was on a pike kind of thing, but obviously a giant robot. I think I accomplished what I wanted to make, so let's paint them. I followed the same exact steps as I did the other heads, using the same shimmering pigments and techniques. I actually painted this head the same time I did the other head, so that made it a little bit easier too. Really no different than the first head, and this head is done now too. I like having the variety of terrain, especially making it really cool sentinel head. And that's it. We made an awesome Magneto and two amazing Sentinel train pieces. We printed everything, we painted everything, and tried a new interesting technique using nail pigments. I always have fun trying these new techniques and ways to make minis better. It was a shot in the dark with the nail pigments to be honest, and it took some experimentation to get it to work just right. But it really looks good. I really like the purple hand and how it came out. It's a cool color. I also have a few other guys that I know I will use this technique for too, wink wink. So tell me what you thought. Did you like it? You hate it? You plan on trying this nail pigment technique? But what about also the rules for Magneto? Well, here's a last surprise for all of you. I told you this was going to be an action-packed video. I made Magneto's character card as well. So now we can print him, paint him, and play him right away. So let's talk about Magneto's character card for a crisis protocol that I made. To put it bluntly, Magneto is awesome. He has devastating attacks and can control the battlefield. So let's go through the card. First his name, Magneto, and his alter ego, Max Eisenhart. Simple enough. Next his stats. He has six stamina, a medium speed, a size of two, and a threat level of six. This means he has a higher cost, but for good reason. For his defense, he has a physical of five, five for energy, and four for mystic. So pretty good defense stats. Now to his attacks. First is called Deadly Debris, and it shows Magneto hurling metal things at his opponent. It's a physical attack because it's physical things being thrown and has a range of four with a strength of five. This also allows him to gain power to how much damage he deals. This is a basic attack and obviously Magneto wouldn't have strike since he isn't a melee type character. Next we have Magnetic Pulse. This is an energy attack and it's an area attack with range of three, strength of four and a power cost of two. So area attacks are attacks that hit all characters within the distance around this character and this affects friendly and enemy characters. So you have to be careful using this attack around your team. 
With a range of 3, it's a pretty big attack, which means it can cause a lot of pain to a lot of characters. This attack also has a special rule called Repulsion. Repulsion occurs on a hit, so it has a 25% of triggering. And it says that any character within range of 2, so a little bit closer than the area attack itself, gains stun and is thrown back at a medium distance. So this is Magneto just throwing his powers everywhere, pushing things away from him. Pretty cool. And lastly, we have Magneto's best skill called Fatal Attraction. This is an energy attack with range of 4 and a strength of 9 with a power cost of 4. So it's expensive, but pretty high strength. It even gets better. On a wild, it causes bleed and slow, and on a crit, it causes stagger. So we have a high chance of getting some pretty big statuses on enemies. Bleed means that a target character takes damage after he activates. Slow is a condition where a character can only move a small distance. And stagger means that a character has to use an action first to undo this effect, meaning he gets one less action. So this is a lot of hard hitting stuff in this one attack. And this move, Fatal Attraction, has a nice history to go along with it. In a major X-Men crossover called Fatal Attractions, Magneto rips the adamantium out of Wolverine. Magneto basically almost kills Wolverine, and later Wolverine comes back with Bone Claws. It's a pretty amazing event in X-Men history and one of my favorite comics. Now to his superpowers. First, we have a superpower that is a leadership type, and it's called Mutant Superiority. Now, most leaderships have an affiliation attached to them. Affiliations are used when building your team. You pick one affiliation that a card details which characters are part of that. So like Captain America's leadership, which is affiliation Avengers, only affects the characters listed as being Avengers. Now, since the game isn't out, we don't really have these cards yet. However, we can make an easy assumption for now. I will make a card once I know what they actually look like too. For this leadership, we will say that it affects all characters with the Brotherhood of Mutants affiliation. If you didn't know, Magneto was the founding member of this organization, and it consists of characters like Toad, Blob, Mystique, etc. Anyways, this leadership says that any Brotherhood member gains two extra dice when a critical is rolled. Usually crits let you roll one additional dice, but this leadership power gains you two. So if you're a good dice roller, obviously not me, then you can really rack into successes. Next we have Magneto's bread and butter superpower. It's called Magnetic Control. This allows Magneto to control characters or things on the battlefield. It's an active skill that costs two power. It uses an action and states that Magneto can choose to pull, push, or throw things or people a medium distance who are size four or less, and within a distance of four. This allows Magneto to control the battlefield in a huge way. So this could be a pretty big game-changing move and really shows how Magneto could use his power. Next, we have a reactive power called Master of Magnetism. This has a power cost of 1 and says that after an opponent declares an attack on Magneto, Magneto can redirect a physical or energy attack to another character using the same range of attack. This can only be used when Magneto is attacked with an attack that has a range of 3 or more. So let's say Iron Spider shoots his enhanced webbing at Magneto, which is an attack with a distance of 4 and strength of 3. Magneto can use this skill, shoot this skill from himself to another enemy at a distance of 4 and strength of 3. Basically, he reflects the damage of someone else and can cause the same status effects as the original attack. He could even reflect it back at the same attacking character if he wanted to. Next, we have an innate power called Magnetic Force Field. Since it's innate, it has no power cost. It says that when Magneto can reroll all failed physical energy defense dice rolls. On each reroll, if it becomes a success, Magneto gains one power. This shows Magneto with a big orb of magnetism around him, just like what we see in the comics and cartoons. It protects him against most attacks, and it just allows him to gain more power. And lastly, Magneto has an innate ability to fly, pretty standard innate ability that we see a lot. So Magneto has great control of objects, some cool attacks that can cause some really good damage and statuses, and has a good defense against energy and physical attacks. On top of that, he has a leadership power for the Brotherhood of Mutants that grants two extra dice on crits for the team. In short, he's awesome, and will be a fun character to play with. And now we come to our actual final ending for this video. So we made an awesome Magneto Mini, two Sentinel Heads, learned a new mini painting technique, and made some rules for Magneto. Wow, I'm exhausted. This special 10th episode was pretty jam-packed and took a while to create. But I had a good time doing all this and sharing it with all of you. So let me know what you thought about this video and let me know what your favorite part was. I always like to hear what you guys think. Thank you for watching this video, and thank you to all my patrons and supporters. I hope to have more videos soon, so stay tuned.